Okay. Can everybody hear me? No? Yes? Okay. Yes, over there. Um, so today, we're going to talk about Guzzle. It's the HTTP client that is part of Drupal 8 core. Um, and there's a lot of technical content that I'm going to cover. Um, and it's going to focus primarily on Guzzle itself. And then if we have time at the end, I'll leave room for questions. So first off, my name is Michael Dowling. But uh, since we're at a conference and nobody knows people's names, only Twitter handles, I'm MT Dowling on Twitter. Um, I'm a software development engineer at Amazon Web Services. Um, that means that I program stuff. And I work on the AWS SDK for PHP, which is a software development toolkit that allows PHP developers to connect to Amazon Web Services like EC2, S3, in an idiomatic way. Um, but beyond just providing the simple um, direct API one-to-one -one with uh, each web service, we also provide abstractions over, over them. For example, uh, we offer a stream wrapper for Amazon S3 that you can just upload files to S3 as if it were a file on disk. So we offer some really cool stuff in the SDK. You should check it out. Um, and then when I'm not working, I'm working on open source projects like Guzzle, which is why we're all here today. So today, we're going to cover these things. Uh, we're going to talk about what Guzzle has to do with Drupal. And we're going to cover the basics of Guzzle itself. Um, I'm going to touch on version 3 of Guzzle versus ver version 4 and why it's a big milestone for the project. And, uh, and then at the end, we'll cover how you can test Guzzle clients effectively um, in a good way. So first off, what does Drupal and Guzzle have to do with each other? Um, so if you didn't know this already, um, Guzzle is the official HTTP client of Drupal 8. It's built into core. If you download Drupal 8, then you're going to get Guzzle's source as well. Um, and it's already been implemented in several of the modules. A lot of those modules are to do with testing. Um, it's utilized by Gout, which I believe is also used in your testing system. Uh, and Guzzle was added to Drupal to replace Drupal HTTP requests. Does anybody, has anybody used Drupal HTTP requests? Yeah, everybody? Cool. Um, so apparently, that's not um, the greatest function in the world. And it's huge. It's really hard to test. Um, but don't take my word for it. Boomba Tower, a guy from the Drupal community, he opened an issue. And he was talking about um, Drupal needs to get a better HTTP client. If, if Drupal is going to take itself seriously as a platform to build web services on top of, then it needs to take seriously the way in which you connect those web services. So here's what Boomba Tower had to say. Drupal's current outgoing HTTP capability is, to be polite, minimal. We have one small function with a lousy API that can do basic requests, but that's it. If we want to be serious about web services, we need strong bi-directional HTTP support. So what jumps out at me here is that Boomba Tower is mentioning that um, Drupal wants to be serious about connecting web services together. Um, which is a trend that we're seeing more and more. When you build your applications, you're not just building against stuff that you build. You probably have to connect with third-party APIs. Like I already mentioned, Amazon Web Services. Um, if you run an e-commerce, you might have to download shopping feeds or upload your data to an ERP system. So there's a lots of stuff that you need to interact with. And um, Drupal's also, it's, it's powerful itself as a, as a web service framework, but you need a powerful client to connect these frameworks together. So with that said, why didn't Drupal choose to use something built into PHP? Or why didn't Drupal choose to use a different library? But that also begs the question is, why did I create Guzzle in the first place? So I'll kind of enumerate the different options that we have and, um, and talk about the pros and cons of those. So first is file get contents. And you probably all use this. It's pretty awesome. It, uh, it allows you to register protocols. You can even register custom stream wrappers that know how to work with different services like like the S3 stream wrapper I talked about. Um, it's really great for quick things that you need to just get done, and you don't need a lot of power. Um, it has a bit of a clumsy API. So if you need to add custom headers or, or you want to control timeout settings, you have to create a stream context. And that's a PHP resource. And then you add that whenever you use your file get contents call. Um, it's also quite underpowered. So it doesn't support persistent connections. So if you need to send a request to the same web service over and over, you're going to pay a, a, an overhead for every request, because it has to reconnect and um, 
do the DNS resolution if that's not cached. It has to do all this stuff over and over. You also can't send requests in parallel. So file get contents gets a sad face. Um, and then there's curl itself. Curl is amazing. It's probably the best HTTP client that exists. It can do almost anything that you'd want it to do. It works with tons of different protocols, FTP, um, SSH even, um, HTTP. Um, but the problem with curl is to use it effectively and to get the most out of it, you kind of have to be an expert at curl. Um, so if you want to use persistent connections in curl, you need to reuse the same curl easy handle. But if you reuse the same curl easy handle for just about every request you're going to send, then you can actually end up polluting that easy handle with request options that can't be unset. The reason this is is because, like, say you add an accept encoding header or an, an accept encoding option to a curl easy handle, that pollutes that handle to where you can't remove that value on future requests. So then every request you would send from then on would have stuff associated with it that you don't want. Um, PHP 5.5 added a new feature called curl reset. And this is awesome, and it's utilizing Guzzle 4. But it, it allows you to basically reuse an easy handle, um, get rid of everything on it except for the connection cache and the cookie cache. So that's great. It's exactly what you need, but it's not available in PHP 5.4 or earlier. Um, and then so you might th say, well, I can just use curl multi-handles and throw away easy handles, but if I use, reuse the same multi-handle, I know I'll have a connection cache because that manages the cache. Yes, it does, but um, that even you have to be an expert at and know that you need to do selects and how to do those, how to work with Windows, how it's broken sometimes, and you get a negative one return value. It's not documented. So there's a ton of stuff you need to be an expert in with curl. It's awesome, but you've got to be an expert at it. So curl directly gets a sad face. And there's Peckle HTTP. It's a lot like curl. It's very powerful. Um, the biggest problem I have with it is that it's just not, it's not built into PHP. So if you're building an, um, a library or something like that, you can't just rely that your users are going to have this available. Um, so because it's not as available as every other extension like curl is, I'm going to give that a sad face too. And then there's duplication. So this is, this is like the, uh, the Yagni. You're not going to need it. So um, if, if Drupal were to just say, well, let's just remove Drupal HTTP requests and let developers do whatever they want to do, um, you end up in a situation that I was in like five years ago whenever I first created Guzzle. Um, so I worked at an e-commerce, and <clears throat> we had to interact with a ton of different web services. We had to interact with our ERP system to tell it like what orders we got that day so that people in the warehouse could pick and ship the products to, to the customers. We had to interact with ad services, all kinds of stuff. And a lot of times what you'll find is these services... They offer a PHP client, but it's not really the greatest thing in the world. Um, usually the error handling isn't even thought of. Um, it might just trigger PHP errors out of nowhere. Um, they're usually not tested. So I ended up just basically rewriting every client we ever had to interact with. And I ended up rewriting the same thing over and over when you don't need to. You can have a, a great base foundation framework and build on that, um, which is why Guzzle was created. So duplication and doing what, what I used to do and creating your own curl wrappers over and over, that gets a sad face, too. So, okay, well, then I created a client on top of other stuff. Well, what about other user land clients that are available? Um, Mike Carper from the Drupal community, he opened up another Drupal issue that got a ton of uh, feedback on it. And Mike did a comparison of a ton of different user land HTTP clients, and uh, he compared things like persistent connections, parallel requests, Basically things that Mike needed himself, but also that other common Drupal modules needed. So he came up with this big graph here. I don't, you probably can't read it. That's not the point of the slide. It's just to show that there's a lot of stuff that he looked at. Um, but it, it compared different libraries like Buzz, Buzzy, Guzzle, PHP Multicurl, HTTP PRL. Um, and it just went through a big list of, of, of things that are they capable of this, are they not? And then we had references to everything. Um, so what ended up happening is... Um, I guess Guzzle had more yeses than everything else, and anything that it didn't have a yes on originally, I was able to help walk through the issue and add features as needed. So with all that, um, the Drupal community chose to adopt Guzzle as the HTTP client. But Drupal isn't the only one using Guzzle. It's also used in the AWS SDK for PHP. It's used in Gout. It's a common web scraper in PHP. You can use that to, to scrape pages and... Uh, iterate over HTML nodes as if they were CSS nodes, so like use CSS selectors. It's really cool. Um, the biggest statistic here that I think is, is impressive is that 
Over 1,000 packages on Packages have a direct dependency on Guzzle, and that's really awesome. And it's been downloaded over 1.7 million times. So let's talk about Guzzle itself. Now that we know the what, I'll tell you how it's implemented and how it works. Guzzle's an HTTP client, and apologies for this slide, but some people ask me, like, how can I use Guzzle to build my backend and to make it an awesome MVC framework? Well, you can't. Guzzle's the client. It's a lot like your web browser. It sends requests to a server, and it gets back a response over the internet. All right, that's out of the way. <clears throat> so Guzzle sends requests. Um, in Drupal, they have this uh, helper function. It's a static function on the Drupal uh, class called HTTP client. And this will give you a basically like a global copy of the same HTTP client. Um, once you have that, you can start sending requests with it. So here we're doing a post request, passing the URL, and then Oh, yeah, I've got arrows. <laughs> so uh, the HTTP request that gets sent from Guzzle is going to look like this over the wire. And you'll see it, it, it serializes it for you. It, it does the, uh, the headers. It adds a content length that, um, based on the post request. It adds a content uh, type that you needed. And it also will... And then um, finally, you can get the body, which uh, you can echo it out as, as a string. But when you're working with JSON services, you can just call the JSON method of the response. This will handle JSON decoding the response body. It'll implement error handling. So if uh, an error occurs while you're parsing the JSON, it'll throw an exception. And then you can just access it using associative array syntax. Now, response bodies. Yeah, you can echo them because they implement two string, but they're actually classes that you can you can interact with. So here we're getting the body from a response object, and then you can echo it, cast it to a string. And be careful with that because it actually loads it completely into memory and then prints it to standard out. But you can also use tell. Um, tell is from like you know uh, Linux ftel, but it it tells you at what position in the file you're at. So a stream is a stream of data. It has bytes in it. And as you read, you, you increment where you're at and your position in the stream. And tell tells you what your position is. Then it also can expose its capabilities to um, who are, who, who's using the stream. So it'll tell you if it's readable, if it's writable, or if it's seekable. And you can use all these things together to, to interact with the stream objects as you need. And then finally at the end, it shows how you can loop over a stream object and read bytes as needed rather than loading it all into memory. Um, just use the EOF function and the read function. But streams, they help protect you from loading all this data into memory by default. It uses PHP's uh, temp stream abstraction. So once the amount of data exceeds two megabytes in the stream, it switches to a temporary file on disk. Um, so when you're sending requests uh, through a client, there's all the HTTP methods are available on the client, like put, post, delete, um, everything you need. But if the method that you, you need to say is a custom method and it's not listed there, you can actually create a request object using the create request method of a client. Here we're creating a get request. And then um, you can set headers on the, on the request and build it up as needed. So for example, if you wanted to create a request and then pass it around to different collaborators that modify that request before it's sent, you can do that with a request object. Set headers, add headers. Um, you can remove headers. Uh, and then finally, when you're done building up your request object, you just call send. You pass the request object to the client send method, and that will return your response object. 
Cool. So I mentioned um, Guzzle 4 was released, and it's a pretty big milestone for their project. And Drupal actually um, is using Guzzle 4 now. When they initially adopted Guzzle, it was on Guzzle 3. But I addressed a, a few concerns that, that y'all had, like uh, curl was a requirement. I removed curl as a requirement. Now you can just implement uh, your own stream adapter. Uh, not your stream, your own HTTP adapter, so that curl's no longer required. And then also has some other really cool features in it, like better performance. Uh, I went through basically every line of the code and either rewrote it or updated it in some way to make it just architected better, um, more testable. It's simpler. I removed a lot of features that, that were either there for backwards compatibility or that should be added on at a higher level. And also now in Guzzle 4, um, we use curl easy handles by default to use uh, persistent connections if PHP 5.5 is available. And if not, it's still using curl multi, which is still powerful and everything. Um, but if you're using PHP 5.5 and you benefit from these architectural improvements, it's about 40% faster when you're sending requests serially with Guzzle 4. Um, swappable HTTP adapters are now possible. So you can swap out which adapter you use, whether or not you want to use curl, a stream, stream adapter, or implement your own. By default, Guzzle uses curl. But curl's not always available. While it's one of the most ubiquitous HTTP clients in existence, it's like been downloaded over 500 million times, um, it's not always on every system. And sometimes, and I think this is a more important issue, you run into version-specific issues with curl, where, for example, they had an issue when you used a SSL certificate authority, and you reused a curl easy handle, you would get a memory leak. So people need to be able to work around this, and that's why I introduced swappable adapters. Um, and then curl's not available, or if you use the stream true request option, we'll use the stream uh, HTTP adapter that uses file get contents. Um, and then there's some opinionated stuff that I wrote about in a blog post I made whenever I released a release candidate. Um, I feel like these give Guzzle a better all-around implementation and make the library much easier to maintain. And I'll kind of go over a few of those. They're opinions, so you might not agree with all of them. <clears throat> in Guzzle 3, all the implementation details were mostly protected methods and protected properties. Um, I don't like that. I think that it makes code hard to evolve, and it's hard to maintain. Because by making something protected, you're basically making a statement that this is part of the public API of this class, because you could extend this class, and you, you, sh you should be able to rely on this. And if, if you can't rely on it, then I need to make a, a version bump, a major version bump, because that, that would be a breaking change. Um, by changing these implementation details to private and only switching things to protected when I say, this is what I've designed this class to be extended and how it's supposed to be used, it makes the extension points much more explicit, and it makes it easier for library maintainers to maintain these, these classes. Because people rely on the API, and you focus on making sure the API can do everything it needs to do, on collaboration and composition rather than inheritance, um, and it makes for a better product. Okay. Then uh, parallel requests in Guzzle 3 were batches. So that meant that say you had 100 requests you wanted to send, and you wanted to send them in chunks of 10. So you would take 10 requests and send it to your batch, and then when those 10 are done, then you go get the next 10, and then you send those. And that's fine, it works, but it, it introduced a lot of complexity. Um, when an exception was encountered in any of the batches, it was um, buffered and then thrown finally at the end of all the batches. So then what you would get would be an aggregate exception class that I don't even know what I was thinking or how you would use it. It was a bad API. Um, so now it has async rolling queues, and that is a weird way of saying that as um, a request completes, a new request is added to the, to the pool. You basically you specify a pool size of, say, 10, and you seed it with 10 initial requests, and then you start asynchronously sending those requests in parallel. When an error occurs, you're then expected to implement a listener that deals with the error asynchronously. Um, and exceptions are not thrown when you're in the parallel request async mode. Um, and another one that's kind of controversial is I removed exception markers. I don't think that these add value to PHP projects. Do you all know what exception markers are? No. OK, cool. Um, but they're basically like a library that, um, sorry? Yes. Okay, they're a library that, um, you, it's a library thing that you can do it's where all of your excep exceptions extend from a base interface. And then you can catch any exception thrown by that library. 
And that sounds good in theory, but it doesn't actually add any semantic value to the exceptions you're throwing. So when you start adding a subclass for invalid argument exception or unexpected uh, or bad method call, things like these, those aren't things that you can, you can recover from. Those are errors that just need to get bubbled up and, and you need to handle that in your application layer. Um, and if you find yourself needing to catch every exception thrown by a specific library that you're utilizing in your application, then you're probably not using exceptions correctly either. You need to, when you call that, that library, when you call a method with it, try catch the exceptions that, that that method's known to throw, and then decorate or throw your own custom exception that's specific to your application. So I got rid of exception markers. Um, so with all these changes, and I think it makes a great, a, a much better product, um, in the words of Beyonce Knowles, it's time to upgrade to Guzzle 4, I think she said. Um, <laughs> If you're creating a new project, start with Guzzle 4. Don't use Guzzle 3. Um, only use it if maybe you're stuck on PHP 5.3. Uh, and something Drupal did recently was adopt Guzzle 4, which is really awesome. So now let's talk about request options. These are the things that you use to, to create a request object from a client, and it controls the behavior of a request, controls um, how the response is downloaded, things like that. The first, uh, we'll talk about some of the more common ones. Headers is a really common one. You just pass a hash of headers. Um, here you're just setting some custom like xfoo header. Then timeout. So you can specify a timeout, which is the total time a transaction can take. You can also specify a con connect timeout, which is only um, the connection time. So DNS resolution, connecting the sockets. And these are specified in seconds. Oh, good question. Uh, I don't remember. <laughs> but I think there is one. Yeah. <laughs> but if you wanted to specify your own default, you can do that with um, the defaults value of a client. Um, when you create a client, you can give it a hash of constructor options. And one of those is defaults. And there you can specify the hash of request options you want to apply to every request created by that client. So say you're building up a client that needs to interact with an API that you know uses basic auth. You know it goes through a proxy because it's on your, your own server. Um, and you can even set like query string values that get sent with every call. So that's what um, the defaults value of a client allows. Um, body is another request option. This allows you to upload data to the remote server for things like put and post. Uh, bodies can be a string. They can be a PHP stream, so like f open. Or you can give it a guzzle stream, which is an abstraction that allows you to more flexibly work with streams of data. Oh, yeah, arrows again. OK, save two. Save two is just like body. It's the analogous form of what you do with a response body. Um, you can save the body of a response to a file on disk by providing a string. So it'll open that file, and it'll start pumping data into it. Or you can give it a fopen or a, PHP, uh, or a guzzle stream object. Query is uh, another common option that people use. It just adds a hash of query string values to the query string of the request that you're going to send. Um, and Guzzle will um, take these nested query string values and serialize it in the way that PHP does with HTTP build query. You can also change out the uh, serialization strategy using something called query aggregators, but we're not going to talk about that today. Debug is a common option that you'll use if you run into issues connecting to an API. Um, if you open an issue on someone who builds a client on top of Guzzle, they'll probably ask you for this first thing, is to give me the output of debug. And what this does is it goes out to the adapter that you're utilizing, and it'll dump out what that adapter did and the debug information from that adapter. So like curls debug output, uh, or if you're using the stream wrapper, it'll give you that debug output. There's a ton of request options, and I don't want to talk about all of them, but you can view them on the online documentation, uh, and it's all implemented in Message Factory if you want to see a cool double dispatch implementation. So now we're going to talk about the event system. The event system in Guzzle is basically how you build robust applications and inject behavior to clients, inject behaviors to requests at runtime. It is. Um, uh, it models the life cycle of a request, so before you send it, after you send it, when it completes, an error. You can intercept requests um, 
in an, in an event listener. So if you want to stop a request from sending over the wire and using a different response, you can do that. And the event system in Guzzle is kind of a fork of the Symphony Event Dispatcher. And the reason that is is because um, I changed some stuff around to be more explicit with how you create listeners. Um, it's a bit faster because of this. I think it's significantly faster because of this. I moved subscribe events from a static method of, the, of a class to a instance method, which allows me to actually utilize an event interface rather than having to rely on a concretion like the event class from Symfony. Uh, so this is why I did that in summary. And then here's some vocabulary. Um, there's an emitter. This is a thing that you register events with, and it dispatches event objects to listeners. Then there's listeners. Listeners get registered on an emitter, and um, they listen to specific events by name with an event priority. And they that event priority allows you to manage the order in which listeners are invoked. And this is pretty important. And then subscribers are a collection of listeners, and they can encapsulate more uh, complex behavior. You can get an emitter from anything that implements the has emitter interface. Uh, clients and requests both implement that. If you add a listener to a client, then that listener or subscriber gets added to every request created by that client. The, the emitter of a client is basically a prototype that gets cloned and added to every request that's created. So this is an example of both getting an emitter from a client and getting an emitter from a request. <clears throat> so adding listeners, you use the on method. Uh, of an emitter. Once you get the emitter, just call on, pass in the name of the event you want to listen to, then pass in the function. This is a callable in PHP, and then an optional priority. So in this example, we're, we're registering the event on to a request, and we're saying, before the request is sent, print out the request using echo. So listener priorities, be deliberate about which priority you specify. Um, because if you're doing uh, a signer for a request, you want to make sure that you're signing the request after it's been mutated and when it won't be changed again. So like when you sign it, if, if, if you change the request after you sign it, it might make that signature invalid. So you need to be deliberate about where and when your events get registered. And in order to make that easier, I noticed that it was a little bit hard to know like where should I put this event then. Uh, event priorities are just basically a number line. So negative values come before positive values. And it's just like a number line. So negative 10 is going to get invoked before 10. Um, so use landmark priorities. These are priorities that have added to um, Guzzle HTTP event request events. There's a bunch of constants there that you can use um, to kind of get an idea of where in Guzzle itself we've decided to use different priorities. So on every event, there are early and late priorities. Early means it's going to be emitted really early in the event lifecycle, and late means it's really late. Um, the before event, you can use prepare request. This is what Guzzle uses whenever it takes your request object and injects things like content type, content length, um, and determines whether or not your HTTP protocol version is correct. Um, so you can hook into that event. If you need your event to fire before that happens, you can subtract from these constant values. If you need it to fire after, you can add an arbitrary number to them after. And then there's sign. This is an important one that um, if you add an event listener after the sign landmark and you modify the request, then you're at risk of breaking people's signature implementations. So keep that in mind. And then finally, complete an error. They have these specific um, constants. Verify response. This is when Guzzle says, okay, I got a response. I was able to connect, but is this a 200 or a 300 level response? And if it's not, then it will throw. And uh, redirect response is when, um, right before Guzzle is going to redirect a request. Event subscribers are basically a collection of event listeners. And that allows you to create easy to distribute um, behaviors, and it allows you to make more complex behaviors um, in your application. So if you were implementing an HTTP cache, for example, that has a lot of different events that you need to check on and that you need to implement handlers for. So you would probably bundle that up into a subscriber. Because you, you can't share a bunch of anonymous functions with people on the internet. That's why subscribers were invented.
Um, subscribers, you have to implement a function get events. This is, just returns a hash of the event name and then the callable you're going to invoke. And uh, this adds behavior to clients or, or requests at runtime. You can add a subscriber to any emitter using the attach method and just passing the subscriber. So here we're adding the history subscriber. And um, so every time a request is sent by this, this particular uh, client, it will keep and maintain a history like a browser. So there's lifecycle events, like I mentioned. There's before, which is before a request is sent over the wire. There's headers, which is you sent the request over the wire, and you're about to download the response body, but you haven't done that yet. Then there's complete, which means you were able to get a response, and error, which means um, an error happened at any point in the request lifecycle. You can intercept the before event, the complete event, and the error event. And this basically means that you stop the event chain at that particular moment, and uh, you intercept it with a response object. So this is useful for, for example, caching. Before you send a request over the wire, you check to see, do I have this cached? If so, intercept the before event with the cached value, so that way you're not going over the wire. Um, and when you intercept, it stops event propagation. Further listeners won't get invoked after you've intercepted. So this is an example of intercepting the before event. Uh, basically, here you're checking is the path of the request slash path, or slash foo. And if so, then use this canned response object. No need sending over the wire because I've, I've got this. Uh, and you intercept, and then it, it keeps the further event dispatchers, the event listeners from firing. Then the adapters don't send the request over the wire. Um, and then notice also I decided to explicitly set a priority. So completed requests. You can intercept a complete event as well. Um, well, this, actually, no, this isn't intercepting. But you could intercept a complete event. So say you got a re response that you didn't like. You could try the request again and inject a new response. But this example is of logging slow requests. So this is a common thing that you might want to do. Um, first, you get the emitter, and you register with the complete event. Now, notice that the complete event, it's actually a class. It's not like some raw bag of data with an arbitrary number of keys in it that you have no idea what's there, how it works. It's actually a class that you can get autocomplete on. You know what methods it implements, and it implements only the methods that were intended for that class, how you're supposed to use it. So it's a much easier system than what was found in Guzzle 3. Um, little known fact, probably my fault because I didn't document it, was that you can get um, transfer info from a complete event or a error event. And this transfer information is passed from the adapter to the event and you can get things like how long it took to do the transaction, um, how long it took to connect to the remote server, things like that. So here we're getting that total amount of time. And then if the total amount of time was greater than five seconds, we'll send a message to the error log. Error events work much in the same way as before, complete. Um, this example is retrying a failed request three times. This is a, a failed connection three times. Um, first you get the, you add an emitter, you add a listener using the emitter on the error event. And notice it's an error event class. And then error events can happen when you fail to connect to a remote uh, serv web server or if you um, get a connection error. So one of these two things can happen. If you get a connection error, you're not going to have a response object available. So you need to make sure that when you implement these things that you're you're doing so in a way that you know uh, I need a response or I don't need a response here. So here we want to retry connection errors. So we check, is there a response? If so, bail out and let the further event listeners do their magic. Um, so that's what happened there. I just said that. OK, so tries. So request objects have a bag of data on them that you can, you can use as necessary to implement custom behavior and to give some kind of state to requests relative to the, your custom listeners. It's called the config object. And this is just a key value pair hash that you can use to add arbitrary keys to it. Here we're adding a retries key. And we're grabbing that from the request. And each time the request is uh, needing to be retried, we increment the tries. And if the number of retries is less than or equal to 3, which is our threshold, then we're going to actually uh, get the client from the event using the get client method of that event. That's the same client that was used to send the original request. And we'll call send again with the same request object. And then once that response comes back, 
will intercept the original event with a new response. So this is a way that you can bubble up these new responses into the original event. So that's, that's kind of what I call an event loop in, in Guzzle. So the normal event is uh, event loop is you emit before, you emit headers, and then you emit complete. Um, but if at any time an error occurs, even in the before event, so say that you have an error, an exception's thrown while you're preparing a request. Well, then that gets caught, and then it invokes the error listener. So anytime you register an error listener, you're going to get invoked if there's an error at any point. Um, it, that can also happen on the complete event. So if you've emitted complete and an error occurs while you're trying to, I don't know, persist it to some cache or something, maybe that throws an exception. That's going to also trigger the error event. And then this is where it gets a little more complicated, where the loop thing comes in. Um, say you emit the before, then the headers, then the error event. And then in the error event, you say, OK, I can retry this. So that starts a whole new event lifecycle loop that emits before, then headers, then complete. And if you get back a valid response from that, you can then intercept the original event. And then that would then, once you've intercepted that event after the error was triggered, it will trigger the complete event. So it's sort of this loop that can occur. But all those things that I just talked about, they're, um, you, you don't really need to implement them because most of the stuff we just went over are already implemented in built-in event subscribers to either built-in or modules that you can add on by just using like a packages package. Um, so built-in is the mock subscriber. So it allows you to create a queue of mock responses that, get, that intercept a request, gets sent over the wire, so you can use that for testing. History, it's just like a browser history. Um, redirects are implemented in Guzzle subscribers rather than being like, rather than relying on a adapter to implement redirects is actually implemented with subscribers. Um, and cookies are also implemented. And you should also note that in order to utilize cookies, uh, you have to actually turn cookies on per request. Uh, most web services don't really use cookies these days, so that's why I decided to do that. External subscribers that you can utilize, there's OAuth which allows you to integrate with services like Twitter. There's the log subscriber. So we went over that like uh, logging slow requests. There's actually a log subscriber that you can use to log requests and responses that are sent over the wire to a PSR3 uh, interface. There's a retry subscriber that you can build up really complex um, retry logic. And um, you can say, I want to retry 500 and 503 errors. Um, six times. I want to retry connection errors two times. Um, and you can build up any kind of custom logic there. And then there's a transfer progress. You can use that to, for example, create like a CLI progress bar if you're doing something at the command line. Uh, and there's a fully working HTTP cache subscriber. This is still kind of a work in progress. It works mostly right now. I'm finishing up some last minute changes on it. But it implements HTTP 1.1 caching. So like Revalidate, revalidation, things like that. It can greatly speed up your application if you know that you're using valid cache headers or that the web service you're consuming uses valid cache headers. And then there's a message integrity subscriber. So um, if your web service returns back something like a content MD5 header, you can use that header to validate that the response body you downloaded wasn't corrupted by like a misbehaving proxy or someone eavesdropping on your request. So the message integrity is used for validation of, of responses. And also, you can create uh, your own checksums when you're sending requests as well. So here's a cool example of consuming Twitter uh, with the OAuth plugin. Uh, first, you create a client. And because we're no we know we're going to use this client over and over to send requests to Twitter's API, we're going to set up some defaults. Uh, I forgot to put the defaults hash there. I'll fix that later. Um, so we give it a base URL. I didn't mention this earlier, but a base URL is just like how it works in a browser when you're building HTML web pages. If you make an anchor tag that's relative, say like slash path or no slash and then just your path, then that gets combined with the base URL to, to create a full URI. Guzzle implements the same exact behavior. It follows the same RFC that you would see in your browsers. Um, so that makes it easy to be able to specify relative paths and not have to know a full URL. Um, we can also set auth. So the OAuth subscriber requires that you set auth on your request. Um, and then if it sees, oh, you set auth to OAuth, then it will sign it using OAuth. Next, you create the OAuth subscriber. Um, here, we're just passing in our API credentials, like consumer key and things like that. And then finally, attach it to the client's emitter, which remember, the client's emitter is a prototype that gets added to every request created by it. 
So then you can just call get on the client, and this is going to go send out to this relative URL. It's going to combine it with the base URL and give you back the response object that you can then use, like, say, the, get, the JSON method to easily interact with the JSON response. Um, so when you test clients, or really when you test anything, uh, you should follow these, these, these rules. And it's probably not comprehensive. This is specific to clients. Um, good tests are fast. Developers don't want to run tests that take forever to complete because they take forever. Um, good tests are predictable. If you rely on a, on a third party website or web service to be available when you're writing your unit tests, then those unit tests could fail, which then you have to go through and manually figure out why did it fail. So that makes it slow. So that means no one's going to run them. That means that your, your site could break because you're not running your tests. Good tests have no external dependencies because of what I just said. And they work on a plane because developers like to write on a plane. I did on the way here. Um, what that means, what it boils down to is that good tests don't have access to the network. Don't send HTTP requests over the internet in your unit tests. So how do you do that? Good tests use mocks. Use PHP unit, use mockery, whatever. But inject your clients into collaborators. Don't have a collaborator, a collaborator create the client because at that point you can't mock it. You can't add um, emitters to the client to say, I mean listeners, to add mocks at runtime. So good tests use the mock subscriber. Um, good tests use the mock adapter and use this history subscriber. And we'll cover all these in just a second. So using mocks, use dependency injection, inject your clients, don't have, don't have your cl them creating clients inside your constructors, for example. Um, and you can use PHP unit mockery, just like you normally do. Just mock out the methods that you're sending. So if you know you're sending a GET request, use the PHP unit uh, GET mock builder and then mock that specific method. Have it return the CAN response that you want. So the mock adapter, uh, when you create a client, you can actually specify which adapter you use. If you don't want to rely on Guzzle using um, you know, the most appropriate adapter for your system, you can specify which adapter you want to use. Here we're giving it the mock adapter. And this allows you to basically every request that's sent through this adapter, you get a transaction object. And that object is the, it's a layer of indirection uh, between requests and responses. It's the only point in the library re where requ requests know about responses and responses know about requests. Um, and at this point, you can, all, all you need to do is return a response object. So you can use a transaction or you can say, outside of this class, bind it to a closure that knows exactly what to do. But this makes testing really easy um, and it allows you to test the entire flow of a request um, rather than relying on the event system you can rely on the adapters to know all my events were sent, nothing was intercepted, all my adapters, whether or not I've decorated them or not, were all invoked up to this point. So it allows you to be very explicit about what point you're testing. Uh, the mock subscriber, this is, we talked about this earlier, but it's a queue of responses that you add to a subscriber. As requests are sent, the mock subscriber looks at the queue, dequeues off the top, and then inject, intercepts that event with that queued response. Um, this is great for basically saying, I know I'm going to get this can response followed by this can response followed by this one. So you can build up these queues and, and inject those into your listeners. You can also mock exceptions. So say you want to ensure that you're handling errors uh, gracefully, you can add request exceptions to a mock subscriber. So this example just builds up the mock subscriber. Um, just call, it's in the Guzzle HTTP subscriber mock namespace create a new mock. You can add responses to it using a string, so you can build up the, the raw HTTP message, or you can give it a response object. Excuse me. Uh, you can add an exception to it. You can, then, then once you've added your uh, request and response, uh, your response and your exception, attach it to the emitter, and then when you send your first request uh, to slash foo, you can get the status code. That was the 200 response that we queued up. Oh, the next one we send to slash foo, we're going to dequeue that exception and it throws the exception that you queued up. So you can use this to build up scenarios in your tests to know exactly that you're, you're working with it correctly. And then uh, finally, a, a, a way in which you can know that you sent the request you wanted to send rather than that you got the response you wanted to get, the history subscriber allows you to, to inspect every request you've sent through that client. Um, so create the history subscriber using new history. Um, then attach it to the emitter. 
then once you call all of your, your – when you invoke all your requests, it actually creates basically a ledger into the history subscriber that you can then use. You can count uh, the history subscriber. You can get the last request that was sent through the history subscriber or the last response. You can enumerate over all the requests and, and inspect specifically, did I set the right header? Did I use OAuth? Did I send it to this specific path? So it's really handy to combine history with the mock subscriber and the mock adapter to, to unit test effectively. Don't send requests over the internet. Yeah? I don't see how history is attached to this client or emitter. Uh, so I didn't create a client in this example. Yeah, but um, it's just assuming that you already have one created. And then I, oh yeah, I, I put mock instead of history. But I'll, I'll fix that later. Good catch. Um, so there's some other projects that are written on top of Guzzle, the HTTP client that we just talked about. So the HTTP portions of Guzzle are part of Drupal core. But there's other things that are built on top of it, like Guzzle commands, which allows you to encapsulate operations on a web service using basically a hash of input, and you get back a hash of output. It implements it, its own sort of request uh, command lifecycle, and you can use that to build on top of um, to, to say you wanted to use Swagger service descriptions at runtime. You could create a command implementation that utilizes that. Um, but so th in Guzzle 3, there was a thing called Guzzle services. I don't know if anybody ever used that, but it, it's a handy way to describe an API using a JSON document. You say what methods it's going to send, what the response should be, and then how you serialize it over the wire, how you parse that response over the wire. Um, so Guzzle services is an implementation on top of Guzzle commands that you can use today. It's still in beta, um, the 4.0 version, but it's, it's very much usable. So in summary, we talked about why Drupal and Guzzle are working together, um, gave you the basics of Guzzle, the event system, and how to effectively test Guzzle clients. So um, I hope that gave you everything you needed to know about Guzzle, gave you the tour. And uh, now I want to open it up for questions, if anybody has any. Yes. There is a microphone if you want to use it, but I can repeat your question if you don't want to get up. Right. The question was, am I going to take my fork that I made of the event dispatcher and try to merge it back in upstream? Um, no, because it changed the API of the event uh, uh, of the event dispatcher from Symfony completely. Um, it uses different methods. It, it has stricter uh, method signatures. Um, so because of that, I mean, I might I could raise an issue or something like that, but they wouldn't change it or, or merge it in for the 2.0 branch, um, maybe in a three of Symfony three, but I don't know. So as of right now, no, it's it's a guzzle emitter right now. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, my name is Brian Hirsch uh, from the web team at the White House. First, thank you very much for all your work on this. I, uh, I rewrote the uh, AWS SQS module proof of concept built on your latest PHP SDK uh, for the 1.0 release. Had a great Sweet. experience. Awesome. And then we also used Guzzle for uh, the tweet server we built for State of the Union. Awesome experience, again, just scratching the surface. So thank you. Awesome, thank you. Um, we are interested in building some, you know, sort of interactive tools with an API that we've been building out, um, you know, like the WordNIC API documentation or Swagger. Uh, I assume lots of people using Guzzle want to build these sorts of things uh, and use Guzzle under the hood. Do you know of projects that are doing this sort of thing so we're not reinventing the wheel if we want to write a module for this? Great question. Um, so I mentioned Guzzle services. So that's Guzzle's web service description format that uses its own custom JSON document. Similar to Swagger, it's not exactly one-to-one, -one, um, but the way that that was implemented was on top of the Guzzle commands repository, which gives you the foundation that you need to build these types of systems. So if you looked at the Guzzle services repository in GitHub, you could see exactly how you're supposed to implement this. It's basically an event system. So before a command gets sent, you're, you're expected to serialize a request and then inject that into the command. And then when a command has completed, when the response was received, you're expected to implement a listener that then parses a response using the description format that you're going to utilize and then gives back whatever object your, your abstraction is supposed to give. 
So exactly that's what Guzzle Services does. It's built on top of Guzzle Command. Um, they're both fairly stable, and we're working on an upgrade to the AWS SDK that's going to utilize them as well. So once that's done, I'm sure I'll, I'll tag like a stable release of that. But check those out. It'll help out a lot, I think. And those are running on Guzzle 3 or 4? Version 4. Okay, great. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Cool. Thank you so much for coming.